microphone problem, so I'm going to chat just a minute to see what, oh, are we, are we switching to, worked out before we started. <laughs> All right, well, uh, good morning again, and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. What a joy it is to be gathered as God's people. Uh, there are a few announcements I'd like to uh, check in with you about as we get started. <clears throat> um, today is All Saints Day, which is a day in which we recognize those who have gone before, who uh, have demonstrated love and faith to us. And um, <laughs> so sorry, we're having all kinds of technical issues today. <clears throat> And uh, there will be a time, you've noticed in the, um, in the bulletin, there are some names that are listed, and as is our tradition, there will be a point in the service in which we read those names out and uh, give thanks to God for them. There is a name that is not listed in the bulletin, who is somebody who hasn't been an active member of the church for a while, and so I, I didn't realize this when we were putting the bulletin together. But uh, Barbara Youngflesh uh, died this year, and she is actually the person who made this a lovely banner that we have here every Sunday. It was made for a presbytery meeting in which different congregations had banners to present forward to demonstrate how we're all part of something together, but we also have a unique public witness. So Barbara Youngflesh, his name will be included in that list. You'll also notice Susan Stipp. Uh, she is the wife of Rhodes Stipp, former pastor here at First Presbyterian Church, um, who, who died recently. Um, I also want to acknowledge that next Sunday is going to be, we're going to have a, um, our dedication Sunday. Uh, letters have been mailed. I don't know if you've received them or not, but that talk about the opportunity to support the church in various ways. And one of the ways we do that is that we make a, a commitment to what we anticipate giving, uh, not just of our finances, but just of ourselves in general. Um, and that will be this coming Sunday. Um, the beautiful thing about that is we're also going to have a congregational meeting that day in which we will elect uh, our new class of officers for the church, elders and deacons. Um, so those two things just go together beautifully, and we look forward to celebrating that next Sunday. Um, Carol, did you want to say something about the cleanup that we had? If you, if you do, I need you to come to a microphone. Either, either that one or that one. Either one is fine, but I need you to, need you to come to a microphone. Phones, either one you want to do, um, because it helps those who are worshiping with us online to not have that dead space and wonder what's going on. Um, and also, if you're past the third pew, then you will be on camera. If you're not past the third pew, you will not be on camera. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, and um, I wanted you on camera for those folks who are worshiping online. Take it away, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Um, projects are things like we have a door that needs to be scraped and painted. Um, you can walk around and see where there's some little trees growing out of our shrubs that need to be taken care of. Uh, little things like that. So talk to Carol if you want to be involved in the ongoing care and maintenance of God's property. Uh, the last thing I wanted to lift up is that there is a downtown candlelight lessons and carols. There are going to be lots of opportunities for, uh, for singing carols. There's going to be one for singing carols on the corner here like we did last year. We're going to bring back our Christmas dinner uh, as we have done in the past. But particularly right now, I wanted to let you know that uh, there is a community lessons and carols service that will take place at Park International uh, on the second Sunday in December. Um, if you want to be involved in the community choir, 
then meet at First United Methodist Church on uh, December 1st, the first Thursday in December, and there will be a, a choir rehearsal there. The, the carols are traditional Christmas carols, and so they'll be familiar to you, and, uh, and I hope that you'll be a part of that community choir. I'll be one of the pastors that is doing the readings in that service, and uh, folks from different congregations are going to be involved in that. So uh, the first Sunday of December, uh, sorry, first Thursday of December at 5.30 at First United Methodist is the rehearsal, and then the second Sunday of December, uh, which is the 8th at Park International at 5.30 is the uh, community lessons and carol service. It'll be a great opportunity to express unity between the congregations to demonstrate what it means to be the body of Christ and individually members of it. So I hope you'll put that on your calendars. All right, uh, with all these things in mind, let us, oh, sorry, there is one more. I'm being flagged from the back. One more announcement that needs to be made. Please find a microphone. Okay. Um, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that my grandmother was, uh, had a stroke and was taken to a hospital. Um, this past Friday, she unfortunately passed. Um, there is going to be a memorial service that I will most likely be attending this coming Saturday. Um, I'm doing okay, but I please, um, I ask that you please give my, keep my family in your prayers. Um, the second thing is I want to remind you of, in case you missed it, at 930 every Sunday. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for sharing that with us and being vulnerable and looking to the church for care. We love you. All right. Very fitting for All Saints Day as we celebrate those who have uh, gone before us and those who are with us now who remind us of God's love. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God together with all that we have and all that we are as God's people together. Eyes and body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily distracts us. And let us run with perseverance 
the race that is set before us. Let us look to Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Let the gentle waters of baptism call us to confession. Let us join our voices and our hearts in confession together, and then also silently and personally before God. Let us pray. O Lord, have mercy on the sins of your servants. May we banish from our minds all disunion and strife. May our souls be cleansed from all anger and malice toward others. And may we find in the fellowship of worship, oneness of mind, and peace with one another. Amen. Hear us now, O God, as we offer silent personal prayers before you in the chapels of our hearts. Amen. Beloved of God, let us assure one another of God's forgiveness. For we have been forgiven by God. Therefore, let us forgive one another. Let us show signs of peace and reconciliation. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Hi, peace be with you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
since you guys are already over here, I'll just ask any of the other younger disciples that want to join to come on over here. All right. So you brought some friends with you today. You guys are like, what's going on? Why is the minister talking to me right now? Am I in trouble? You're not in trouble. Everything's fine. But you guys, scoochy, scoochy. Got to make space. Got to make space for everybody. Probably can't have the bags in between you because we got more people coming. Yay, this is a fun Sunday. Because sometimes we'll have this time and the only one, there's like one person down here. Like sometimes it's just Sam, you know? So, yeah. All right, can we all fit? Yeah. All right. Just barely squeeze in there. No, squeeze in there, Xander. Well, then make space for other people. I would. Okay. 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 Cool. Good example. Good setting the example. Good job. All right. So that actually, I can work with that. So <laughs> what do you think of when I talk about the saints? Okay, I'll come back to you. What do you think of when I say th when I say thanks, saints? The saints football, team. football. Is that what you were gonna say? No, what were you gonna say? You were on the saints. Wow, early draft pick. Like church saints. Okay, okay, all right. So, have y'all been to a church, a, a sanctuary where you saw like little statues of people around them before? Some of them do that, yeah. But we don't have any of those here, right? Yeah, so that's because we have a different view of what it means to be a saint. So there are some churches that have, and, and sometimes you see it in somebody's yard too, like that little, there's like a little statue in somebody's yard, and sometimes it's Mary, or sometimes it's Francis, or some other saint, yeah? So those are people who lived and who have died, and they were so close to God while they were living that people believed that they're super close to God now. And so when we pray and when we want help from God, then some people will say a prayer to a saint because they're like, maybe you can uh, put a good word in for me, you know, since you're close to God. Well, that's how some people think about saints, and that's fine if they want to think about them that way. But in our church, what we do is we look at the Bible, and in the Bible, did you know that some of the Bible is just letters that were written back and forth? Because they didn't have like email or, you know, text or that kind of thing. So they would write letters. And in some of the letters, they, they say, this is a letter to the saints of this church. Do you think they were talking about a football team? No, 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 no they weren't talking about a football team. So they were talking about people who were close to God, people who demonstrated God's love, kind of like the way William made space for somebody else. So good example of how all of us can be saints, because saints aren't just people who have already died and who are with God. But saints are people who are here and now with you and me. All right, so here's what I want you to do. In just a second, after I tell you to do it, I want you to stand up and point to two people, not me, uh, because, you know, like, I'm just up front and I've got this stuff. So, like, I'm an easy answer. Uh, somebody who you think tries to help you know about God's love. So I want you to, when I, when I say go, I want you to point to two different people who you think helps show others about God's love. All right, you ready? One, two, three, go. Awesome, awesome. All right, good job. So I like it that, um, that at least one person pointed to themselves because that means, yeah, each of us are people who can share God's love. All right, you can put your hands down now. It's usually not polite to point, but I asked you to do it, so it's okay. All right, so that's really all I wanted you to know about. I wanted you to know that saints are people who teach other people about God's love and that all of us can be a saint for somebody else. So how about you stand up and we'll say a prayer. You guys can repeat after me. Wow, we got a big group. Are we going to hold hands? Are we going to do that? Oh, come on, we do it. Here you go. All right, so you guys repeat after me. Hi, God. Hi, God. It's us. We love you. Thank you for saints who help us to know about your love. Help us to be saints, too. Amen. All right. Y'all can go back with your parents, or you can go with Mrs. Dorinda.
heard, and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. It can be found on page 336 of the Old Testament in your pew Bible, if you'd like to read along. This is the story of Naaman, a general from a foreign power, learning about the true nature of humility. Listen now for what the Spirit of God has to teach the church today through this ancient text. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Naaman commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Now, the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted to the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Here ends the first reading of God's holy word. Our gospel lesson comes to us today from Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. You can find it on page 7 of your New Testament in, in your pew Bible if you would like to read along. Uh, this portion follows the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's gospel. Listen now for what connections you might find between this and the previous reading, and for what the Spirit might have to say to us, the church, this day. Matthew 8, 1 through 10. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and there was a man with a skin disease who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. 
be made clean. Immediately his skin disease was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When he entered Capernaum, a a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible distress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard it, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, In no one in Israel have I found such faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today we have two texts that involve military leaders with personal needs who are seeking healing through the grace of God. Naaman was a Syrian general who approached Elisha with the blessing of his king, which created some tension for the king of Israel, understandably. In Matthew's gospel, we have an unknown person suffering from leprosy, the same as Naaman. Hope everybody got that connection. That was kind of a softball I was throwing. Uh, <laughs> suffering from lep- leprosy, the same as Naaman, and, uh, and then a centurion who, whose servant is paralyzed. Now, the reading in Matthew, as it was assigned, and some of you may have noticed in the bulletin was a little different, um, it only included the first story. But it seemed appropriate to me to to include both when I was reading them. Pairing the first story certainly connects the actions of God through Jesus with the actions of God through Elisha. But as I I read it, I couldn't help but notice the centurion's faith and Jesus' response. It's kind of an antithesis to Naaman's faith. Matthew 8 follows the Sermon on the Mount. We said that earlier. And Jesus has just laid bare all that he has come to teach about. I mean, there are certainly parables and other means of teaching that follow in the Gospel of Matthew. But the Sermon on the Mount sets the tone for all of that. And it ends in verse 7, 28, and 29 with an astounded crowd. They are astounded because Jesus doesn't teach like the scribes. He doesn't teach like someone who's, you know, copying and pasting someone else's sermon. (laughs) He teaches like an author, one with authority, because he was the embodiment of God's very self. Now, it makes sense, then, that the first thing he might do is to put that sermon into action. The first thing he might do is to heal this random person in the crowd who calls him Lord and says, If you are willing, you can make me clean you know, if you want to. I'm just saying you could. It's an option. I love the idea that Jesus finds agreement with him in his place of need, just the same way that Jesus does for you and me. And Jesus says, I will. Yeah. And then commands him not only to be made clean, but also to go and show the temple priests proof of what Jesus has done. Now, we don't always think of these stories that we have in Matthew's gospel as part of their narrative quality. And one thing I do want to raise as a kind of a caution flag when we talk about showing the temple authorities what Jesus has done and the tension that we find in the gospel there is particularly in this day and age where there's a lot of uh, anti-Semitic and racist rhetoric that's going around. People are doing and saying things that I just didn't even think they would say when I was a kid. Uh, but it's out there. And so I think we have to be careful that we don't forget that Jesus was a Jew himself and, and a reformer of sorts. And we don't think of all these things when we hear these stories. Sometimes we just think of our traditions and our own experiences. So I think it's important to think about the, the narrative quality, the storyteller that Matthew is, because he tells a good tale. Now, first we have this rock star public speaker, Jesus, who's laying out the foundations of belief And then he he stops, not only to heal, but to send a message to those who are gatekeeping the faith. 
Then the centurion, who represents the architecture of oppression for God's people, this centurion says, hey, I got a guy who's suffering, and I see that you're pretty busy. Based on the chain of command, could you just, you know, make it so that this guy can get up and get to work? <laughs> and Jesus says, oh, yeah, you really get me. You, you understand. And in verse, verse 13, he says, let it be done according to your faith. And the servant was healed that very hour. This centurion seems to be Naaman's opposite in that he was humble and not expecting a direct audience and that he also placed his hope and his trust in the actions of Jesus over and above his own. Naaman was used to being recognized. He was a force to be reckoned with who also had the ear of whatever king he was sent to by his patron. He was magnanimous and used to making gestures that had the same weight so it would have been normal for a sacrifice, or like it says in the text, come on out and say the words and wave your hand, do something special for me. It wouldn't have been odd for there to have been a sacrifice of treasure or grain or some valuable incense that could be brought to appease the wrath of whatever divine force was against him. And nothing was working, working, so his wife's servant, captured in a raid, boasted about her God and her God's prophet. Elisha. Now, there are lots of things that are interesting in that one statement. And one is that the king's blessing for Naaman was because of these successful raids, one in which the slave girl was probably captured. And, they, and these raids were successful against people who served another god. Now, in the Hebrew text, everything is attributed to God. Success, failure, rain, drought, famine, feast, Everything is either with God's intervention or God's allowance. Victory and defeat were, they were more connected to the faithfulness of those in charge. But as we move to the time of prophets, we find that success as a nation is as deeply connected with the character of the people as it is with the ruler. Now, culturally in the region, if a people were successful, it meant their God was more powerful. So that brings us back to Naaman. This is how bad it must have been for him, that a slave from a people that his king had subdued in this raid suggested that her people's God could help him. And as laughable as that may have seemed to him, it at least gave him the chance to make the king of Israel nervous, which it did. And who knows, maybe that was part of the intent of the king that sent him. You know, kind of, well, maybe it will work, maybe it won't, but at least I get to antagonize that guy. Anyone who has a brother knows what I mean by that. Clearly, none of you have brothers? That's not funny? Okay. <laughs> Clearly, he did antagonize the, king, the Israelite king, but I don't think that's really the, the main objective here. The main objective is that Naaman was willing to be healed by any means necessary, wanted to be healed by any means necessary. And so it's no surprise that he was really put off by not being greeted and then told to just go jump in a river. Go cleanse yourself in the river, not even coming out. And again, it was the servants who told Naaman, if you'd been asked to do something hard, would you have done it? What's the harm in doing the easy thing? And of course he did, and he was healed. And the moral of that story is that God doesn't move on our commands or actions. Deeper still is that the people of power rarely are those with faith in something other than themselves or their own power to command. Which is why the centurion is such an interesting contrast, the centurion in Matthew's gospel. Because not only is he a person of power, but he is a person of power who is advocating for the health and well-being of someone who serves him. And we don't know enough to say what that relationship was like, and Jesus is clearly not making any kind of an endorsement of the occupying power of Rome or slavery or servitude or any of those things. What Jesus is doing is acknowledging the role of faith as it connects to wholeness and healing. The story about the centurion is also important because it sets up our expectation for who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. Now that's the hard part, isn't it? Our expectation of who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. When we face chronic illnesses for ourselves or those we love, a miraculous cure seems like a pretty reasonable request. And where still is the question of whether or not God said no to that request? 
or maybe that God is powerless in the face of it? These are certainly questions that will be on the top of my list when I leave this mortal coil. But for now, I must be satisfied with this. God has placed us here so that we might encourage faith in one another. God has put us here that we might speak to those with power over us and boldly say that there is a God and it isn't them and their tanks and their bombs and their guns. There is a power in the universe, a benevolent power in the universe, and it is not the invisible hand of a greedy and soulless marketplace. There is a God in whom we live and move and have our being, and that God is seen most clearly in the presence of compassion. Just as the servants had compassion for Naaman, Jesus had for that stranger and the centurion for the working person. It is that sense of compassion that seems to be most dear to the heart of our text today and is most missing in the world today. Pick your poison, pick your issue, listen to see where the compassion is real and true and where people are trying to marginalize you out of fear. Now, of course, I say these comments in the midst of an election season as politics on every level seems more designed to divide us than unite us. Political strategies and propaganda certainly are nothing new, but they have taken on new life as ethical boundaries around false presentation of the other seem to melt in the fabric of the internet. Now, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, anything you can't find online or on TV, but I am telling you that we are approaching a level of crisis that we just haven't seen in generations. And I can't give you any assurance that things won't get worse before they get better, but I can tell you that they will get better. I can tell you that compassion still holds the key to making it out with some sense of dignity, some sense of meaning and purpose. Compassion is the key to leaving any kind of legacy behind. Compassion is the witness and testimony of Scripture today. Now think on that for just a moment. Ask the kids to point out people who taught them about God's love. Think about those people in your life who have been memorable and unique. And chances are that those memories are like pure gold. You know, you may have heard this before, but when you refine metals, silver, gold, what have you, it's melted to the point of liquid, impurities rise to the surface, they're removed again and again. That's the dross that we sing about in that old hymn, How Firm a Foundation. You know, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The metalsmith removes the dross time and time again until the surface becomes like a mirror and they can see their own reflection. So it is with faith as we turn to God again and again. So it is with us when we offer compassion to others and find our humanity reflected in their faces and their humanity reflected in ours. So it is when we vote our conscience as though it were a prayer for the kind of world we want to see. So it is when we gather around this table and we demonstrate a foretaste of the kingdom of God. Here we find the compassion of God and here we are recreated in the image of the one who tore the curtain in the temple that separated the holy and the common. Here we say to Jesus, Lord, if you're willing you can make me clean. And here we hear him say to us, I am willing. Be made clean. May it be so with you and may it be so with me. And to God be the glory now and always. Amen. Let us stand and sing and give glory to God.
affirm the faith we share using the words of the Nicene Creed, which can be found on the inside of the back cover of the hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Now we take a time to consider God's love, God's grace, God's mercy for us and how we might demonstrate that love and mercy in the world. Uh, there is an offering plate in the back for those who would like to make an offering as you leave today. Also, there's the opportunity to give online uh, with the QR code in the bulletin and um, a, a link on the Facebook page as well. Um, consider not just what you might give financially to the church, but how you might demonstrate love and hope and mercy in the world and how we might demonstrate love and hope and mercy in the world together as God's people.
friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture tells us that God's faithful people will come from east and west and north and south to sit at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. This is a foretaste of that table. This is the Lord's table. And you who have much faith and you whose faith may even be a little shaky, you who have been wounded by the church, you who have wounded others without regard to your intent, you are welcome here. This place of grace is not about what you have done or what's been done to you. It is about what has been done for you through the tender mercies of God. If you're joining us today and you're not from a Presbyterian tradition, I want to assure you that all are welcome at this table, uh, that in our tradition, particularly on All Saints Day, it's a beautiful thing that we have elders in the church who will act as servants for the church. Uh, We call them ruling elders, not because they lord authority over, but because they guide the church in our service together. And so uh, we will be passing the plates uh, with the bread and with the cup through the pews, Um, as we are a priesthood of believers who will share that sacrament together. Let us join in the prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give our thanks and praise to you, the God of Abraham and Sarah, Miriam and Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Ruth, David, all of the priests and prophets of old, Mary, Joseph, Peter, and Paul, apostles and martyrs and ordinary unknown saints. You are the God of our mothers and fathers and our children to all generations. You, everlasting one, made us all. You fashioned us into a people and continue to love us even when we deny our godly heritage. Always you call us home to you through saints dedicated to your will. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with all the people of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. gracious God, for the gift of Jesus of Nazareth, who lived in accord with your will to the point of laying his life down for the good news he preached and the good news he passed on to us. On the night of his arrest, he taught us how to serve one another in love with a ritual of table fellowship enjoyed by followers of the way of Jesus of all times and places. And so in remembrance of Jesus, who is the Christ, We offer ourselves with thanksgiving as a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. We boldly proclaim the mystery that is revealed through faith. Spirit of the living God, make us one as we partake with these your gifts to us so that we might be in communion with you and one another. As we break bread together, may our eyes be open to see your glory. As we lift the cup of salvation, may we be strengthened to follow your way until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together with all the saints. Keep your church one in service to the world here and now, even as we pray for for the world you love so much. Speak your peace into the world where there are wars that rage and violence triumphs. Speak your peace into the world for the health of all nations, that all people may flourish. Speak your peace in the world, in the midst of the elections in our country, and for all people in positions of power over the lives of others. May your will be done. May your kingdom come. 
We pray for those who grieve, for those who long for wholeness and healing, for those who struggle to live in the fullness of faith. Send forth comfort as only you can give. Hear us now, O God, as we light candles for the memory of saints who have gone before us, who now live in your embrace. Invite the acolyte to come forward. There are names listed in your bulletin, which I will share as the candles are lit. And then there will be a time of silence in which you are welcome to speak into that silence the names of those you love, people who have gone before you. Helen Los. Joe Reddick. Robert Nash. Jerry Brandmeier. Susan Stipp. Barbara Youngflesh. As the candles continue to be lit, hear us now, O Lord, as we share the names of others, those who have gone before us, who have testified to the faith that we share. As we continue to light candles, we also give thanks for those who are with us now who help us to understand and know of your love. Hear those names that we might lift up of the saints who are with us even now. Elois Peterkin. Hear, O Lord, the names that we have called out, not into the void of nothingness, but into the sure warmth of your love, from heart to heart, from hand to hand, that space in between each of us in which we know you hold us. O Lord, hear us as we pray, continuing to share the witness that we've received. And hear us as we pray, as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Thank you. Friends, as we gather, we remember how on the night of his arrest and betrayal, Jesus met with his closest disciples, his good friends, and shared the Passover meal, becoming the Passover for us. He broke the bread, having given thanks, and said, whenever you eat of this, remember me. This is my body. It is broken for you. In the same way, 
He took the cup and pouring it out, he said, this is my blood, which is sealed, <clears throat> the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. And so whenever we eat of this bread or drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again in final victory. Again, I will be serving the elders first, and then they will pass the plates amongst you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
So join through Holy Communion. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer once more. Loving God, as those who have joined, been joined through Holy Communion, we commit to lives that are worthy of this gift, lives that demonstrate love and grace and mercy, so that we may become those who others see as reflections of you and your love for us. Amen. Before the charge and benediction, I want to remind you to watch your mail if you haven't gotten it all ready for the letter that's going out for this coming Sunday. Next Sunday is Dedication Sunday, and also we'll have a brief congregational meeting after church for electing officers. Now, go out into the world, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the suffering, honor everyone, rejoicing in the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. Now and always, amen. amen.